Good morning. I've finally chickened out. After months of faithfully sticking to one of the two readings appointed for morning prayer each day, today's New Testament reading, 1 Timothy 5, stumped me. Of course I looked at it. It's not a passage I think I've ever looked at before. It's about how to treat widows, real widows, by which Paul seems to mean widows who are really on their own with no family support or accumulated wealth with which to go out and enjoy themselves. Now, of course, when Paul writes of such things, he is aiming at the human weaknesses he observes in the Gentile world in which Timothy, to whom he's writing, is working. The sort of gallivanting widows he has in mind seem to be wholly alien to Jewish society, but I'm no expert in such matters. Anyway, I couldn't see a way of using that reading, so instead I've turned to my favourite Gospel writer, Luke, because he provides the reading for any Holy Communion service held today, and that'll do for me. Here it is. On one occasion, when Jesus was going to the house of a leader of the Pharisees to eat a meal on the Sabbath, they were watching him closely. Just then, in front of him, there was a man who had dropsy. And Jesus asked the lawyers and Pharisees, Is it lawful to cure people on the Sabbath, or not? But they were silent. So Jesus took him, and healed him, and sent him away. Then he said to them, If one of you has a child, or an ox that has fallen into a well, Will you not immediately pull it out on the Sabbath day? And they could not reply to this. I looked up Dropsy, and it turned out to be not unlike what I guessed it to be. An accumulation of liquid somewhere in the, the body cavity, leading to swelling and therefore I assume discomfort and unsightliness. If we remember how sensitive the Jews were to any physical abnormality or disfigurement, we can well understand why Jesus would have wanted to cure this poor man. He may not have been a total outcast, as a leper would have been, but I imagine he would have been shunned by many and was possibly ritually unclean, which would have cut him off from the worshipping community in his local synagogue. We're beginning to know what it's like to be cut off, aren't we? I don't know about your family situation at the moment, but our daughter Vanessa, rector of Walthamstow, as I'm sure you know by now, and her husband Cameron, living in East 17, are now in Tier 2. So now we can only see them outside. Up until last week, although we would meet in their large garden, we could go into their house if we needed to, though only to use the loo. Now even that's not allowed, and without being too graphic, we simply couldn't manage the two and a half hour round trip plus the time we would spend with them in falling temperatures. So we're cut off and we see little prospect of seeing them face to face until at least the spring. No wonder there's been some weeping recently. And I know we're not alone in this. Millions of people, hundreds of millions around the world are in the same position. I'm sure some of you are too. We were made to be social creatures needing one another. Jesus came to save us from our sin so that we could be received into his heavenly kingdom, but he also came to show us how to live well with one another while we're here on earth. In its rather unnuanced way the Ten Commandments did that for the Jews and are still to be found on panels and in stained glass windows in Church of England churches built up to the end of the Victorian era. Children were made to learn them by heart, and they're easy enough to remember and recite, which children love doing. But by Jesus' time, there was a lot of debate among the scholars about which commandments were the greatest, and it was a question that came up in an encounter between Jesus and a young lawyer. In the version of this incident as recounted by Matthew, it was Jesus himself who said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbour as yourself. And for once, this answer seemed to have received the assent of all who heard it. 
In Luke's version of that episode, it was the young lawyer who was invited to answer the question and he gave the same answer to Jesus' approval. And that was followed by the parable of the Good Samaritan to illustrate what it meant to be a neighbour. In these difficult days when we are all to a certain extent cut off from some of those we love and need, the concept of neighbourliness has never been more crucial to our survival. Jesus defined a neighbour as one who shows mercy. Mercy tends to have a very narrow meaning these days, perhaps sparing somebody from aggression or punishment. But its fuller meaning, as when we ask God to have mercy on us, is a complex set of meanings to do with forgiveness, compassion, selflessness, generosity and general kindness. COVID-19 should make us look at one another in a new light, a more neighbourly light, especially when we remember that many of them are, like us, experiencing long and painful separation from those that they love most. We're less than two months from Christmas, which is a rather startling thought, isn't it? We know how society becomes kinder for a little while at Christmas. People are more courteous, they greet strangers with warmth, are sometimes helpful, sometimes generous to those in need. That needs to happen now, and it needs to go on happening not just until that blessed day when, somehow, we are declared safe from getting infected, but permanently. We, the Christians, who have been taught by our Master what being a neighbour really means, who know that our neighbour is not just someone who happens to live close by, but means every human being who needs our love and compassion, whoever they are, whenever they need it. We are the best people to model, to exemplify neighbourliness. In our passage from Luke, Jesus stumped his scholarly listeners by asking if there was a time when one should not be neighbourly which in this case meant, was there a time not to heal a sick person? Strictly observant Jews struggled with this. Healing was working, and working on the Sabbath was forbidden in the Ten Commandments. Jesus wanted everyone to see that there can be no limitation whatsoever to mercy. For us, just as was true then, there is no time to close our hearts to others. Neighbourliness, like a dog, is not just for Christmas, it's for life, for everyone's life, life in all its fullness. Neighbourliness can, like Covid, be infectious, but far from threatening life, it enriches it. It's the sort of infection of which we can rejoice in being super spreaders. I'll finish with a prayer. Lord Jesus, help me to see my neighbour in everyone I interact with, Help me to remember that there is a spark of the divine in all human beings. Help me to remember that however we treat another person is how we treat you. Let us not lose an opportunity to show mercy in its widest sense to whoever needs it from us. In your name, we, your followers, ask this. Amen.